Hello and welcome to the Wellbeing Podcast, a podcast where we discuss all things relating to your well-being, ranging from nutrition to physical and mental health. I'm Amanda Hayes, your host, a nutritionist with a passion for well-being. Today I'm here with Nick Muxlow. Nick has many strings to his bow. He is a teacher, an author, and we'll be discussing Nick's book in this podcast. He was a junior lacrosse player and coach of the state league. He's an ultramarathon coach, a seven times Ironman finisher, including a PB of nine hours and 10 minutes in Hawaii. Wow. He is president of the Lakers and Adelaide based triathlon club and an ultra marathon winner, including the five peaks ultra, the Hubert 50 kilometers, the Cleland ultra, and the list goes on. Hi, Nick. Howdy. Thank you for coming in. Thank you. Thanks for having me onto your podcast. Oh, it, it is a pleasure. So today we are going to focus on Nick's role as an ultra marathon coach. But before I go on, I'll mention that any advice on the wellbeing podcast is of a general nature only. So for advice specific to your own situation, or in this case, if you want to start ultra marathon training, you should consult with your medical professional first. So Nick, to set the scene, can you tell us what is an ultra marathon? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so an ultra marathon is actually any run that is longer than a marathon, which is 42.2 kilometers. So if you were to do basically a warm up or a cool down <laughs> after a marathon, you could actually call yourself an ultra marathon runner. Um, but normally the distances are uh, sort of 50 kilometers, 100 kilometers, and then quite often 100 miles. Um, which is 160 kilometers. Wow. And then also, um, as you would be familiar with, some multi-day stage races are often uh, really around the ultra marathon principles. Oh, wow. That's pretty impressive. So most um, marathon runners can probably claim that they're ultra marathon runners with a, you know, a one minute warm up. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. So, um, so Nick, what was your first ultra? Uh, my first ultra was actually Eurobilla, oh, cool. um, which is pretty much... Um, our or South Australia's biggest ultra marathon, um, which is a fantastic trail starting at uh, Belair in the Adelaide Hills and then going through to Athelston, taking in pretty much all the main um, peaks and trails along the way. Yeah, I've done that one and it is absolutely beautiful. It's um, If you live in South Australia, I thoroughly recommend it. And so, Nick, um, what attracted you to ultra racing? Why ultra marathons? Yeah, I've just I've always been really fascinated with endurance um, and basically being able to run um, or run, swim, and bike as it originally was uh, longer distances. Um, but my love or my passion has always been running, um, and so then once I'd sort of basically uh, been involved with triathlon, I sort of progressed onto just the sole running discipline, um, and really that sort of. You know, the ultra running is really starting to take off and the trail running at the moment. It's seen a huge growth uh, period and there's a lot more races and a lot more people doing it. Um, and so it was, yeah, a really natural fit for myself. Oh, that sounds great. I, I, I do participate in some of the local trail runs and even I've noticed over the last five years they've really grown and the participation's just skyrocketing. So it's a great thing. Um, and Nick, just um, because you've had so much experience both in ultra and in Ironmans, can you tell us a bit about some of your best and your worst experiences? Yeah, definitely. Um, probably start, well, my best experience um, is probably a better spot to start. Yeah. And without a doubt, um, you know, the as you mentioned, I'm heavily involved with the Lakers Triathlon Club. Um, so it sort of rolls into one, but basically the friendships and you know, the connections that I've been able to build through that, um, particularly when I was racing more, um, and then being able to qualify for Kona. Um, yeah, that's awesome. In Melbourne was absolutely a highlight. Um, for many, actually qualifying for Kona is sort of more the, the enjoyable experience than actually necessarily <laughs> racing it as well. Um, so I didn't necessarily have the best day out there. I might have broken a few of the um, endurance running rules um, and then paid for it with a bit of a um, slow finish uh, but without a doubt it's still collectively you know racing really well in Melbourne and finally being able to you know execute a race um, that you know you can was a highlight but probably the highlight was sitting 
you know, in amongst all your friends at roll down. Um, for those that are aware of um, what that is, that's where you basically have to accept your slot to Hawaii or to Kona. Um, and yeah, basically knowing that you're going to be able to accept it and, you know, go to the big island. Wow. Uh, I was fortunate that um, I think it was about 13 other club members that year managed to qualify, which is just absolutely phenomenal. Oh, that'd be uh, fun. Did you all travel over together? Yeah, so we all um, sort of travelled as a group. So some people went a bit earlier, some a bit later. Uh, but collectively, when we were there, we you know managed to see the course together, go to the training rides together, experience the whole lot, which just added another dimension, really. Oh, wow. That that would just be such a highlight. Did, did you... Um how many people participate do you know approximately uh, yeah it's about two to two and a half thousand. Oh my god that's massive um, yeah yeah it's it's a it's a big race that's for sure um so a couple of waves and you're all starting the water together um so it can get a bit congested at the start um but yeah, no it's an absolutely amazing day and was it hot when you were racing hot is an understatement <laughs> <laughs> So I'd had obviously many friends that have been there before, you know, talk about it, warn you, but hot and windy just doesn't do it justice. Um, Wow. So yeah, a long Ali drive in particular, like it is, it is literally like you're running in a sauna. Oh my gosh. That just sounds so hard. Um, And so what about your worst night? What's been something, I guess you learn from bad experiences, but maybe tell our listeners something about that. Yeah, probably. Um, one of the, I've actually managed to, uh, when I was a younger athlete, uh, basically go into overtraining or athlete burnout um, twice. And that's probably something that is sort of the low points because you're you're often fit just before that happens and you want to train and you're training well and then suddenly you can't. Um, mm. And the motivations there, you might have a race coming up and you're like, you know, wow, what's what's happening? And it's often not until... Uh, sort of basically you have hindsight that you actually realize what you're in um, at the time and that's something that um, is really challenging to deal with because as you know whether you're a runner you're a triathlete you know you're a long distance bike rider etc we are so invested in our training and what we actually want to achieve that you then have an alternate sort of source that's just saying no you gotta sit down slow down recuperate um, and, and I guess what... it's tricky too because it's not like breaking your leg where that's an obvious problem it's probably quite hard to sort of diagnose and work out what's going on yeah it it can be it sort of presents itself in different ways in different athletes mm. um, and then it's you know once you've potentially been through it it's about recognizing those warning signs and yeah as we'll probably discuss later that's one of the key reasons to work with a coach yeah, as well yeah um so you can sort of avoid that occurring well that's a good segue into coaching nick so um what made you interested in becoming um an ultra coach or i know you've done other coaching as well so why coaching yeah i i guess i've always loved coaching um so from a before I actually even realised it, um, as a junior I coached lacrosse. Um, so when I was, for instance, you know, playing under fifteens, under seventeens, I was actually coaching, you know, the under elevens and the under thirteens. Um, and I sort of remember having this thought that, like, oh wow, that'd be really cool to do. But you know, sort of ten or it's probably 15, 20 years ago now, that actually wasn't an option because coaching wasn't around in an athletic um, sense as yeah, it now that's is. True, yeah. um, and so for me, the natural progression was, well, the closest thing you can get to that is actually physical education teaching, where you're basically teaching kids about all sports, which I love. Um, so that's where I sort of headed to. Um, and then after doing that for a while, I just had a natural progression back to initially um, thinking I'd work with triathletes, but it was actually then all the, the trail and ultra runners that yeah. were sort of wanting to come to me for coaching and, you know, advice and guidance on how to actually finish, you know, often either their first ultra um, or to be able to finish their first 100 kilometer run, which is sort of like that big step up for a lot of people now. The 100 kilometers is really the new marathon. Oh, the holy grail. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, so it was a very natural progression. It was almost um, the athletes finding me that sort of guided me there. Yeah, well, I found you. So um, I am going to ask Nick why a runner should engage a coach and, and what a coach can add. But 
before he answers that, I'm just going to mention that Nick has coached me in 2015 for the Eurobilla uh, trail run, which we mentioned earlier. And in 2017, I ran the Lara Pinta stage race, which is a four day race in the Northern Territory. And both times I arrived at the start line confident I'd put in the work, I had a plan in place and I finished well both times. And now Nick is coaching me for my first ever half Ironman in Cairns in June. And what I love about having a coach and Nick in particular is that he can make the plan really flexible and reactive. So if you get sick or you have to travel for work or um, injured, Nick will adjust the plan to accommodate for that. And the other thing is it keeps you accountable. So I need to report my training sessions back to Nick so um, he can have a look and see how I'm progressing. And, you know, it, it does put that pressure on you to make sure you get all your sets done. So anyway, back to the question, Nick, why should a runner engage a coach? Yeah, absolutely. But I guess before I sort of touch on that, <laughs> it's probably worth me just covering quickly why I actually coach. Um, in the, the sense that basically, um, and you're potentially aware of this, um, although I've probably never articulated it to you, I actually love basically working with people to help them achieve something that they thought was, you know, well beyond their comfort zone or mm -hmm. basically into their impossible. Um, and so then that could be, you know, for instance, in the triathlon, in the running mainly, um, but actually helping them to get to that point that they, um, you know, we're actually fearful about actually going there and know they need some guidance. Um, and that's really coming back to, that's the why I coach. But then basically the reasons beyond that that you should actually then hire a coach, you sort of touched on a couple. I sort of come back to three main reasons quite often. One is the knowledge. Um, and you know, whenever you've done something or you've worked with people regularly, you end up knowing where mistakes are gonna occur and how to prevent them. And so you can then basically um, build training sets that actually teach or give the experience that's needed to runners um, so that they then make those mistakes or they get that knowledge in training rather than actually finding out on race day that, oh, hang on, there's these downfalls or these, these, there's these mistakes or these, these common errors that are going to occur. Um, so really to be able to unlock that knowledge. Um, the second reason is to put a plan in place. And at the end of the day, typically people love running um, or they love, you know, biking, swimming and running um, if it's triathlon, but they don't take the time to actually put that plan in place. And they sort of just wake up, oh, what should I go and do today? And then they, you know, often end up, oh, I'll go for an easy run. And then they go for another yeah. easy run. Um, whereas if you've got a plan, it actually gives that bit of structure, which just makes a huge difference. Yeah. And it builds your fitness as well. Yeah, yeah absolutely. As you say, in a structured way. Um, and it means that, you know, it, within that structure, we can make sure we're targeting your body in the right manner for when um, fitness is actually needs to be built. Um, and then, yeah, the other thing you touched on as well, the accountability and the fun. Mm -hmm. um, so making a commitment to someone and as a coach, you're actually making a commitment to them as well that basically you're saying, I'm going to do everything in my power to help you achieve what it is you want. Um, and that's basically pulling on your full screen skill set um, but it's also as I say it's actually more fun um, and that's because you've got someone that you can call on you know suddenly you've got you know that question that you can't actually ask your partner or you know even someone at training because they may not have that sort of open nature but you can straight away go right this is this is bugging me this is something I want to know and you can then get that um, basically response that you're after from someone who although they're emotionally invested in your training they can actually also look from an outsider's perspective and have yeah. a bit of clarity well i can certainly verify that it works it's worked for me and it does um it does make the whole process really enjoyable and it takes the thinking out of it uh, if you're a busy person like i am and most of our listeners are um, for someone else to come up with the sets for you, it's it's great. You know, I log on to Training Peaks and think, okay, what do I need to do this week? And I make sure I map it into my diary so it gets done. And the other thing too is if you're following a guide from a book, for example, because there are lots of books that have training plans, they can't be flexible. Like they might show you ways that you can change the plan like Nick's book does, but 
it is nice to have a person who can tweak it for you immediately. So I really enjoy that aspect of it. And anyway, I just mentioned Nick's book. It's called Journey to 100, How to Run Your First 100 Kilometer Ultra Marathon and Love It. And Nick, I think this book came out in the, at the end of 2017. Is that right? Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. And it's your first book? Uh, yes, yes, definitely my first book. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I managed to release it, so it was late last year um, at the moment. Um, and yeah, it was definitely something that it challenged me, that's for sure. Yeah, it's a big it's a big thing to write a book, to gather all your thoughts in a logical way and, you know, present it in a way that people actually want to read it. So, but, so why did you write a book? Uh, I wrote a book, I guess there's, there's a couple of reasons. Um, one, for me, it was actually the challenge as well. I've always sort of, you know, had that as something I'd like to do one day. Um, but really, it was more the, the opportunity presented itself that I could see that um, there were people wanting the knowledge. Yeah. Um, and I was having consistent conversations with runners. And so basically, I then um, decided to put it in a logical format. Um, and really, you know, I guess to kind of tie the coaching in with that, when I'm working with an athlete, I can kind of choose which bits of the book I go to for mm -hmm. when they need it. But it was really challenged my thinking to find out a sort of, because a book's a linear um, yes. equation, you read it from start to finish. And so I then had to decide on the best way to actually put that uh, down onto paper. Um, and so that was a really great process for me to have to go through. But now, I guess what I, at least I certainly hope, is that it's basically inspiring runners the world over. So they can pick it up and I know from um, happening to, like I get my Amazon, um, like I see where the oh, books cool. have gone. So I see that, you know, each month there's copies that go to, you know, in Europe, there's copies that go to America. Oh, and that's brilliant. It's, kind of, it's really exciting for me to go, well, um, that's sort of being read all over the world and people are hopefully, well, I know they will be, finishing um, 100 kilometer races wherever they're from um, based on basically the advice and yeah. the guidance that I'm giving in the book. Well, I have to say, I, I love the book. I think it's a great, for even for someone like me who has done quite a lot of running, um, it explained running terms in a really clear way. For example, terms like VO2 max. I mean, what does that mean and why is it important? So Nick tells you all of those things in the book. And the other thing the book does is it gives you invitations to complete a task. So for example, how to do a fitness test. So it's quite an interactive book as well, which I really like because the fact is if you are going to run 100 kilometres, you need to actually run, not just read a book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You're spot on there. Um, and Nick, you just mentioned to me off air before that you are working on your next book. So can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I have started to put pen to paper and basically the next book is uh, going to be or the working title but i'm pretty certain it'll stick is journey to kona um, how to finish your best iron man qualify for hawaii and love it um, and i guess that's really going back to my grassroots as it would be in endurance racing and yeah putting all that i've learned into a book for others that aspire to complete an iron man and ultimately qualify for hawaii um, to be able to read it and get you know a massive um, boost to where they're going and making sure they're putting everything in place they need that sounds great because I, I have seen on the market books about um, triathlon training plans and things, but specifically about how to qualify for Kona, I, I've never seen that. So uh, the other thing Nick does in Journey to 100, which I'm sure he'll do in his Kona book, is give you really practical steps like what to do on race day, things you need to pack in your bag um, and your kit drop-offs and just, you know, really basic stuff that if you've never done it before, those things can be quite nerve wracking and daunting. So it breaks it down. And, and if you read all of that before you do the race, you're going to feel a lot more secure about the whole thing. So that's, that's something I really enjoyed about the book. And anyway, uh, the next thing I wanted to ask Nick about was um, something that a lot of ultra athletes, runners, triathletes struggle with. And that is how to fuel your run. So, um, Nick, how do you make sure you have enough energy to finish a long race? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, what I guess I'd like to explain the concept, because first of all, we have to understand why we need to fuel. 
Um, and if you imagine you go out and you jump in your car and you want to drive, let's say, from Sydney to Perth. So it's a long way. Why would you want to do that? <laughs> well, yeah, why would you want to do that? Um, and so what that basically means is that if you're driving along, eventually the car is going to run out of fuel if you don't put more fuel in. So you might get 500 to 1,000 Ks off a tank. Um, and your body is actually no different. It's got a fuel tank, um, which in terms of the carbohydrate um, that we burn, has a limited uh, capacity. And so it means that we've got roughly 90 minutes to two hours of carbohydrate um, on our body, which we can burn um, to be able to run. Now, when we're running at a lower intensity, we also utilize or we utilize more fat and less carbohydrate, but we still utilize carbohydrate um, to a certain amount. Mm -hmm. And as our intensity increases, we then have a predisposition to actually burn more carbohydrate. It's our body's preferred fuel source. And so when we put that together, what it means is that we've got plenty of fat, um, each of us, no matter what our weight is on board, but our carbohydrate reserves are actually limited. And mm. so we then need to replace those as we run. And so that then comes back to looking at the carbohydrate content of foods. Um, and that could be, for instance, uh, basically understanding it, it pretty much comes down to your sugars and your, uh, your breads or your white um, for instance, pastas, rices, etc., are all great sources of carbohydrate. Um, and then we need to be aware of how we can actually get those onto us or actually consume yeah. them easily while we're running to the next part of the equation. Um, and so that's where you can look to sports drinks, sports bars, um, gels, if, if you must. I'm not a fan. Many people are. I love them. <laughs> <laughs> One of the few there. Um, but then also, because that's obviously a lot of sweets, um, you know, specifically formulated sports products we can also then look to you know other products such as you know your white bread sandwiches yeah um, your potatoes i know runners that love um like the rice balls um and things yeah and it's one of those things you really need to test it out in your training because if you need to know what you're you're capable of digesting when you're running for example gels work really well for me i did try and eat a Vegemite sandwich once when I was running because you do get sick of the sweetness um, and I found it very hard to chew. I couldn't kind of swallow it. So it's a very personal thing. Yeah, you're spot on. And that's where, um, and I actually mentioned this in the book, if anyone is after more information, um, it does cover this in there. But for instance, you've got like training foods and racing foods. And so because you're obviously training regularly, you don't want to get sick of having the same thing week in, week out. Yeah. But when you're training, you can actually, for instance, you might be able to have a Vegemite sandwich because you might stop for a couple of minutes and eat it. Whereas in a race, you obviously, you don't want to stop. That's not part of what we're trying to do. We're trying to get to the finish as quickly as possible. Um, you know, snakes or lollies yeah. are another great example Jelly of that. Jelly beans I quite like sometimes too. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah, they can be sometimes challenging if it's, again, it depends on the length of the race. Um, for 100 kilometers, it's you know no problem because you're at a lower effort um, to, for instance, chew those. But if you're you know potentially trying to do a really quick time over a 50 kilometer race, you might actually be breathing and working a lot harder and suddenly they're a lot harder to actually be able to chew and you might yes. choose to go to like your gel then or your um, sports drink. Yeah, anyway, it, Nick does explain all of that in his book. So uh, I would just like to thank Nick very much for coming. It's been great to talk to you today, Nick. And I have a question that I am going to ask all of my guests. Um, if you could recommend one or two things that all people could do to improve their well-being, what would they be? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, this one's probably pretty close to my heart. Um, basically, get off the couch. If I had to say one thing, um, and then in the extra time that you have from not sitting on the couch, then I'd love for you to go for a run. Or actually, it doesn't have to be a run, something that has a high effort um, involved in it. And that could be, you know, going and playing a team sport. If it's go to the gym, um, could be going for a bike ride and making sure that you not only go at an easy pace, but you actually mix the pace up when you're running. Um, whatever sport or whatever activity that is. Um, yeah, so basically, things. move. Absolutely, move. That's the message, move. Move. Um, 
so thanks Nick and um, can you just we'll just wrap this up by uh, you can tell people where they can connect with you yeah yeah absolutely if anyone um, is interested in connecting with me then I've got um, basically my website uh, theultrajourney.com um, and likewise I've got uh, both my profile for the ultra journey and my personal profile on Facebook um, that people can find me through and my number is uh, displayed on my website if anyone wants to give me a call or send me an email about coaching at all. Great. Thanks, Nick. Well, um, we look forward to having you back when you've written your new book and talking about um, the journey to Kona. So thanks very much. Love to be back then. Thanks See for having you. me. Bye. Nick, being the generous guy that he is, has given me three signed copies of his book, Journey to 100, to give away. I'll give the book to three people who contact me via the contacts page on Amanda's Wellbeing podcast website and let me know what their ultra running dream is. So that was Nick Muxlow, ultra running coach extraordinaire. I hope you enjoyed the interview and it um, provided you with some motivation to get off the couch and possibly run 100 kilometers. You can subscribe to Amanda's Wellbeing podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, Spreaker, Spotify or YouTube and you can follow the podcast on Twitter, Instagram and Facebook. Direct links to all social media can be found on the subscribe page of my website at www.amandaswellbeingpodcast.com. If you would like to contact me you can send me a message via the contacts page on my website Please feel free to suggest topics you'd like to learn more about and people you'd like to hear interviewed and I'll do my best to deliver that to you. If you enjoy Amanda's Wellbeing Podcast, please visit the Contribute page on my website and see how you can help ensure we continue to provide you with excellent content. Also, please take a minute to leave a rating on iTunes. It improves visibility and will help me source excellent guests. Thank you for tuning in. Eat well, move well, Think well.